Okay, so let us continue with the morning's lecture. So we have been discussing this Li-Yang theory of zeros of partition function. Don't chat now. If you want to organize something, please do it during the coffee break. Okay? Pay attention to the lecture. Okay, so we have been discussing the Li-Yang theory of phase transition. So let me just Mm, recapitulate the main points. So we said that there will be a grand partition function omega of z which depends on the volume of the system n. It's a polynomial. degree proportional to n in general, but let us just say like n. And then if we look at the zeros of this polynomial, they typically lie on some curves. And uh, then uh, n goes to infinity limit. Zeros lie on curves with some density, with some line density. So along, if they, this is my curve, I will be able to define rho of s, which is the fractional number of zeros in this interval. OK? And then, and the omega of z, which is the Actually, I should call something else. Uh, well, yeah, g of z is equal to log omega of z is equal to log omega n of z divided by n limit n goes to infinity is the free energy per unit volume because we divide it by volume. Um, I call the volume n, no? OK, so n is, let us say, the number of sides. So this will be the free energy per side. So let's just be more careful. What we want to do is we said that omega z is the complex free energy per side for the complex activity z. So how do we define that? Uh, it's defined like this. You take omega z defined on the real axis, positive real axis, that is well defined and real positive number. And then analytically continue it to other values of z. And so we said g of z was equal to integral sigma s g s log z minus z s. OK? So this is the log of z. Now it is a complex log, not the modulus of the log, not the real part of the log. OK? So this is the complex activity. And it's defined on the real line. It's, it's, it's real number. So imaginary part is 0. Then when I get off the axis, then the log z will pick up imaginary parts. But it's a multi-valued function, so I just continue it. And I can keep on defining it. If I you come here, there is some imaginary part. I come here, there is some imaginary part. It's smooth here. But when it comes to a line of zeros, then the imaginary part of log z will have a discontinuity. And this discontinuity is equal to the change in the derivative of gz. Okay. So that's the precise definition of g of z because log z is a multi-valued function. It is defined by analytical continuation of the function over the real line and continue it everywhere. So this definition works well, except if you have something like this. Then I don't know how to analytically continue from outside into this stuff. So for the moment, let us not worry about it. There will be some way of defining this. Um, we will not worry about it just now. 
Okay, so that is the definition of GZ uniquely requires analytic continuation. Uh, about the real axis, positive real axis. And then there are discontinuities along the discontinuities in imaginary part of omega of z along the lines of zeros. So next comment is that uh, there was one participant who explained the uh, Lee and Young theorem saying that you said that it is hard to explain, but actually so long as the polynomial omega of z is equal to z to the power n omega of 1 by z, it's a symmetric polynomial on two sides. No, if then all zeros on unit circle. Okay, so see it has some symmetry property which is that the partition function with n holes is equal to the partition function with big n minus small n holes. Okay, with n particles is equal to partition function with n holes, then there is this symmetry in the system and then you will have these zeros. This was the claim, but this claim is incorrect and I will give you this example which I gave actually in the morning. Omega n of z is equal to 1 plus 2 to the power n by 2 z to the power n by 2 plus z to the power n. This thing has this symmetry. I can try to figure out what are the zeros of this polynomial. This is not so hard because I think of it as a quadratic in z to the power n by 2. Then it has two values. And then of course, if z to the power n by 2 has two values, then I can take the nth square root of it, which will give me all the values. Okay? So the zeros of this are actually on two circles like this and they are uniformly dense along the circle. Okay, okay so let us uh, so without going into a lot of formal theory it is good to get some practice with actual evaluation of zeros of polynomials. So if I have a million degree polynomial, how to calculate its zeros, that is the question. And of course the answer is you cannot do it for a generic polynomial. But if the polynomial has some special structure, then we can hope to calculate it. So let us do a practice problem. Uh, that one is actually stupid problem, but let us, you know, this is sort of to start with warm up. So I have a lattice and um, there is no interaction. This is a lattice gas. At each side you can put either zero particle or one particle, but there is no interaction. Omega n of z is equal to 1 plus z to the power n. So this problem is very easy. There are n zeros, all of them are z equal to minus 1. In the absence of interaction, there is actually a delta function at z equal to minus 1 where all the zeros are there. But this was too trivial. So let us take 
less trivial problem, I take a line. Um, I want to take periodic boundary conditions. and there are n sites and the interaction is next um, nearest neighbor exclusion nearest neighbor exclusion let us guess so what that means is that on this line, if you can occupy a site, this is occupied, but the nearest neighbor of an occupied site cannot be occupied. Nearest neighbor exclusion. Okay? So if you have n sites, you can occupy alternate ones of them that is allowed. That is the maximum possible packing. You cannot put more than n by 2 particles on an n site periodic lattice. So you should imagine that each of these particles has a size like this, then the next one cannot come here, but this one can come here and like so on. Of course, you can imagine bigger radius, but let us work with n equal to 1, nearest neighbor exclusion. Okay? So now, I want, so I have this lattice gas, I want to determine omega n of z. What is it? Well, I, um, I guess um, if you have two sides, then I know what is omega n of z, two sides, it's 1 plus 2z. Because you can only occupy 1 for n equal to 2. So what is it? Suppose I put n equal to 3, then what is it? One plus three z, because you know you can put in one particle, but by definition you cannot put two particles adjacent to each other. So in there, there are three ways of putting one particle. Uh, so for n equal to 4, uh, this one requires more work. But not very hard work, 4z plus with n, you can put two particles on a four side ring in two ways. And so it is plus 2z squared. And I can determine the zeros of these. If you put 5, n equal to 5, of course, still you can only put four particles, and I'm doing OK. If you put 6, then you get a cubic, and if you put 10, you get a quintic, and so on, and then it becomes a little bit hairy. Okay, so, but can I determine omega n of z for arbitrary n, n equal to 500? The answer is yes, I have done it in the past, or you have done it in your class, using transfer matrices. So, I define uh, I usually prefer to, um, there is a transfer matrix T, so that, that sort of that partition function up to N, and then I add one more. So this is a 2 by 2 matrix. You look at the last side, it can be occupied or empty. Okay, this is the vector. But if it is occupied, occupied, you cannot put it there. If it is occupied, and then it has to be empty. Uh, sorry. So if it is empty, then you can occupy it, but you put in a weight z. If it is um, in either case, you can put 1. And so this t is a matrix like that. Now I erase this. And zn is equal to trace t to the power n. This formula is familiar to everybody. 2 by 2 matrices, no? Ising model in a field or some such thing. 
OK, so now this looks much more tractable because this is a 2 by 2 matrix. I can diagonalize it. And the answer is lambda plus to the power n plus lambda minus to the power n. Okay. And I can write down this matrix. Now, this is a small exercise. I can do it here. 0, z, 1, 1, put minus lambda, minus lambda determinant equal to lambda squared minus lambda minus z equal to 0. Done. Okay. So, this answer is actually just very simply 1 by 2 plus square root 1 plus 4 z, ah, 1 by 2 plus z to the power n plus 1 by 2 minus square root 1 by 4 plus z. Power n. You can check, of course that for any n, when you square and add them up, all the square roots will cancel out, and you will get a nice polynomial, Okay, which will, of course, match with these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, but it's a general simple formula. So this is my lambda. This is Zn of, uh, sorry, we had called it omega z. Omega of n of z. Now, what are the zeros of this function? In this case, it's actually easy to see. So I want to solve this equation. Omega n of z equal to 0. So this should be equal to this with a negative sign. So I get 1 by 2 plus square root 1 by 4 plus z over 1 by 2 minus square root foot plus z to the power n equal to minus 1. Okay, So that is easy to solve because you know this the nth root of unity I can write down and then this should be equal to nth root of unity. Yes. Sorry, can you? Oh, the T matrix. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, no, I should explain. So, usually when I want to write the T matrix, I work with um, let Z um, omega R plus is equal to partition function of R side line, open line, with, uh, actually let us call it 1, with uh, leftmost site occupied. So it's a restricted partition function. So I take a R site ring, I put occupy this site and allow all possible positions, uh, configurations of the rest, put in a Boltzmann weight z to the power n if there are n sites in the cluster, add them up, that is the partition function. Then I define similarly omega r0 is equal to everything is the same but unoccupied. The leftmost site is unoccupied. Okay. Now it turns out or it's easy to realize that omega r of 1, omega r of 0, r plus 1. Suppose I have determined all the functions up to r 
and I want to determine them to order r plus 1. So, omega r plus 1 0 is you want this one to be occupied, but then can we do anything or the rest. So, I can choose two choices for this it can be 0 or 1 correspondingly there will be a partition function omega r of 0 or 1. So, there is a linear set of recursion relations between omega r plus 1 of 1 and omega r plus 1 of 0 in terms of omega r of 1 and omega r of 0 and this is a 2 by 2 matrix the set of coefficients and that matrix is this one. Okay. Okay. So, very good. So, how does this work out? Well, if z is positive, then this thing is bigger than this or this uh, stuff will never be equal to 1. There is no, um, there is no hope of this equation being satisfied if z is positive. If suppose z is negative, but less bigger than minus 1 by 4, then this quantity is positive and this will be smaller than this, it would not work. However, suppose z is minus 1 by 4, then of course, the equation is satisfied because the modulus of this is equal to the modulus of this. Okay. So, I, I think I should write. Okay. Suppose there is a little bit less than minus 1 by 4, then this quantity is negative and square root of a negative quantity is imaginary. So, this stuff looks like I can erase this part. <coughs> This stuff looks like 1 by 2 plus i epsilon and the denominator looks like 1 by 2 minus i epsilon, right. So, both of these are the same magnitude, they are like exponential i phi and I want exponential i phi to the power n equal to 1 and so phi can take some real value. If n is large, then phi can take any real value, otherwise it takes some discrete set of values. Okay, so, so the, okay, so in the limit of, sorry, just one more step, which I have worked out in my notes. So, I write this as 1 by 2 plus square root 1 by 4 plus z equal to 1 by 2 plus i epsilon, right. So, z is equal, actually I write one square root epsilon, z is equal to minus 1 by 4 minus epsilon. And then I get e to the power 1 by 2 plus i epsilon equal to 10 exponential i phi, phi is equal to 10 inverse 2 root epsilon. Okay. And then I guess all I need to do is I put uh, exponential i n phi is equal to minus 1, which has n roots. So, it has n values of phi and I will give the roots. More importantly, for arbitrary n, the condition for the roots is that the mod value of lambda plus of z divided mod value of lambda minus of z equal to 1 for n goes to infinity. Okay. So, this is the condition for the zeros of the um, polynomial. Now, this condition will not be satisfied everywhere. In this case, it is satisfied along the negative real line going from minus 1 by 4 to minus infinity. Okay. So, 
as phi varies from 0 to pi by 2, this function will vary from 0 to half plus i infinity. Okay, because there is a 10. When epsilon goes to infinity, 10 inverse will go to pi by 2. Okay. So, um, so the roots of this polynomial lie on this negative real line from minus 1 by 4 to infinity, sorry, all the way up to here. That is where the zeros of this polynomial lie. Okay. I can also determine the density of zeros of this poly, um, okay. how? Because this phi is actually the solution involves different values of phi, but all values of phi are equally likely. There is a root for each value of phi and phi are uniformly distributed on the circle. So, in the large end limit, you should think of phi as uniformly distributed on the circle as a mm, continuous variable, not a discrete variable. And then this transformation tells me that rho of phi will look like this. There is a pile up of zeros near the end because even when phi is very small, epsilon is very small, phi is much bigger because it is the square root of epsilon. Phi is proportional to square root of epsilon. So, the integrated density of zeros from here to some distance epsilon will be root epsilon, which says that the density of zeros will diverge as 1 upon root epsilon. Okay. So, so, in this case, rho of z is equal to non-zero for z on the negative real line uh, real line z less than minus 1 by 4. Okay. And then the density of zeros behaves like this. This is z, this is minus 1 by 4, the density of zeros behaves like this. There is a pile up, blows up. Close up near z equal to minus 1 by 4 as 1 upon square root z minus z 1 by 4. By 4 plus z is negative, so I should write the other way. Or I, I maybe I write one by four plus z mod. Okay, not so good. I think all I did was to rely on the fact that omega n is actually looking like this. It is sum of nth powers of simple functions. And then evaluating all the n roots became very easy. Okay. And then we found that the result is that the zeros lie on the negative real line and they blow up near the end point of zeros as a square root singularity. Okay. So now I can try to see if I can extend this result to some other problem. So suppose I had a same model, but it was not the nearest neighbor exclusion he just had a repulsive interaction with next neighbors. I can still write a transfer matrix. 
just it doesn't have a zero here. It has an exponential minus beta j, beta u or some such thing. And I can do the whole thing. And everything, work, everything works out, except that the position will, of course, depend on beta u. So which comes to the point that as you vary beta, the zeros will change, the position of the zeros will change. But uh, the general character of the solution remains the same. At the edge, the density of zeros diverges as the same square root power. Yes? There was a question? Ah, so I put re repulsive interaction. So get out of the Liang, but I can also put attractive interaction. Okay? And then it's very interesting. All that happens is that as soon as you, you know, in order to go from attractive to repulsive, you have to go through zero. So as you decrease the interactions, the zeros pile up, but this point moves out. And at u equal to 0, there is a single point at which all the zeros occur, minus 1. That is what we discussed first. And then when you decrease u further to make it attractive, then the zeros go like this. You can check. That comes very It is the same equation. Okay? And now the zeros are on the unit circle. Again, as you vary beta, the zeros will move. The, or in our way of saying, we will say that the zeros move and the density of zeros will change, but it always has an edge point and it's a square root singularity at the edge point. In this one dimensional problem, what happens if you decrease beta more and more, it keeps on decreasing, but it never actually closes up. For any finite beta, it remains at a finite distance, only at beta equal to infinite, it actually pinches on the real axis, which is consistent with the fact that in 1D there is no phase transition. So all our general phenomenology was working, except that, okay, the zeros never pinched in on the real axis. No sweat. Okay, so then, ah, can I do this problem? I take a ladder graph like that. And again, there is a nearest neighbor gas. So if I sit at this side, this side, this side, this side are excluded, but I can put one here, I can put one here, I can put one here and here and so on. Okay? Now can I find the partition function for zeros on this ladder? Well, we can still try to use the transfer matrix. Now the transfer matrix is um, bigger because, you know, it, it has to start with, you have to allow the possibility that both of the, you know, I, I have a ladder built up to here and I add two more sites and then try to set up recursion relations for the partition functions at level r with r plus 1. What is the dimension of the transfer matrix? Yeah, in principle 4, but actually only 3 because you can have at most one site on one column. Okay? So, so you write down a 3 by 3 transfer matrix. T is some 3 by 3 matrix. I will not write it down. And then Zn or omega n will be equal to lambda 1 of z to the power n plus lambda 2 of z to the power n plus lambda 3 of z to the power n. Where lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 of z are the three complex roots of the cubic characteristic equation. Okay? And now I want to solve this polynomial equal to 0. So 
the point is the suppose lambda 1 modulus is bigger than lambda 2 modulus is b if lambda 1 modulus is bigger than lambda 2 modulus is bigger than lambda 3 modulus okay so suppose this is we can always assume we can assume no problem this is just ordering by hand so if lambda 1 modulus is strictly bigger than lambda 2 modulus then i look at this equation this term is much bigger than this term or this term no hope that nth power of that term will be able to cancel the other ones so it won't work you won't get any zero okay so for a zero to occur for a zero of omega n z for large n for large n we must have modulus of lambda 1 of z over lambda 2 of z equal to 1. So, that is a condition on z and that condition determines all the places where the zeros will occur. They may not occur, you know, they, but they cannot occur outside this. So, this is the curve on which the zeros can lie. In this case, I guess, in this case, we are in a lucky case. Actually, it turns out it is not so bad because this is a 3 by 3 matrix, but it, it can be converted into a 2 by 2 matrix using the symmetry under reflection. Uh, up down goes to down up. Okay, but ignore all that stuff. Uh, this one you can write the expression fairly easily and again the qualitative features that well there is a dis the zeros lie on some line the actually again they lie on this line and there is an end point and there is a pile up near the end point all of these are the same. Okay. So, that is a some interesting nice feature that in spite of the, so I can do 3 by, you know, I can do this problem. Now, the matrix will be even bigger dimensional, but it does not matter. I will just take lambda 1 and lambda 2 and ratio that equation is true for whatever is the size of the transfer matrix. And so, that is the condition for the partition function to have zeros and that is the equation of the line of zeros. Okay. It turns out that for the case with Lee and Young discussed this equation is just mod z equal to 1, but in general it can be much more complicated. For all these models which have these one dimensional transfer matrix, it turns out that the solution is always of this form and uh, the zeros are like that you know whatever this equation. Um, then people can study numerically this stuff even in two dimensions. Okay. And so, numerically people can generate partition functions um, with mul 1 million degree now and get 1 million zeros and then plot them and see you know what the density of zeros looks like. And so, let me do that just uh, Yes, one minute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I am actually giving some simple examples where you can see the answer immediately. You can always construct much more complicated examples where something else will happen. So, I am giving the typical behavior and I am sort of saying that this is what happens here. And I gave you that, okay, if you change the problem a little bit, the answer does not change so much qualitatively. Okay? But if you change it a lot, if you put some funny interaction, something, something, then the answer will change. Yeah, sure. I am not 
right now, deliberately, I'm not proving any theorem. I'm only giving you examples of systems where you can see the zeros come and how they behave. Okay. So now let me just say that, okay, suppose you do it in two dimensions with only attractive interactions, then of course Lee and Young have already shown that the zeros occur like this only on a unit circle. But now, like in the 2D Ising model is an example, 2D Ising model in an external field has not been solved. So omega of z as a function, you know, in a non-zero field is not known analytically. Okay. However, numerically you can determine the partition function for 20 by 20 lattice or some such thing. And uh, so you find that at t equal to infinity, where there is no coupling, of course all the zeros are sitting here. Then if you, you decrease the temperature, the zeros move like this. And um, typically the density of zeros has this structure. This is my variable s, and I don't know, from s min to s max, seems to go like this. Okay, seems to pile up at the end, some little bit. Then, as you increase um, the beta or decrease temperature, the zeros spread out more, but the behavior is the same. Now they look like this. Okay. So there are regions, there are lines of zeros and there are endpoints of zeros. The lines of zeros have a finite density, endpoints have sometimes a pileup. Okay? And the pileup has some exponent typical divergence which doesn't depend on the temperature at which you are working. So now these zeros, you decrease the temperature, they spread out like this, they come like this. But at a finite temperature, they meet at the real axis, okay? And then below that temperature, there is a finite density of zeros throughout this um, circle. So, if you go to t less than Tc and you calculate the discontinuity in the derivative of the potential, which is the discontinuity in the electric field, which is the discontinuity in the charge density, which is equal to the charge density at that point, it is finite. For the Ising model, it says that for T less than Tc, as you change field, the magnetization jumps by a finite amount, okay, which is our definition of phase transition. So everything is working fine. Ah, but I wanted to know what happens at Tc. So what happens at Tc? Here, the condition is that lambda plus equal to lambda minus, or the modulus of 2 is the same. And so that says that the gap vanishes. If the gap in the spectrum vanishes, that means that the correlation length becomes infinite. So that is where the criticality occurs. The correlation length has to diverge at this point. Uh, suppose we are at T less than Tc, then I have this circle and suppose I am here or even suppose I am here. Again, lambda plus will be equal to lambda minus, the modulus will be same, so the gap will vanish. So all along this line correlation length suitably defined will have to be infinite. Okay. So the whole, so the picture is very nice. You have a complex Z plane. There are some lines where the free energy function is singular. Everywhere else it's well behaved. And there is this electrostatic analogy. You can imagine there is a charge density of zeros and the density determines the potential and the singularity and everything. Okay, so far so good. So, uh, so then, yeah. So, what was realized is that, so you can change the potential now. Suppose I started with some model with Leonard Jones potential, this one. I can make a lattice model with this potential. 
and then there will be some uh, some set of zeros. It does not have to be critical point, no, it is at some value. Now I change the potential here a little bit. Continuously deform the potential. What will happen to the zeros? They will also deform, they will move continuously. All the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix will change in some continuous way. So this line may become like that line. It, 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 it will change a little bit. Maybe this point will also move like that. The topological features of the transfer matrix will not change much. Oh, sorry, topological features of the uh, this picture will not change much. Okay. The positions of the lines will shift as you vary temperature, as you vary interaction, and so on. But uh, key points which are um, for us important is that, OK, there is a density here, and there is an end point. There is some power law behavior of the uh, density at the end points. Okay. Um, so, it turns out that this power law behavior is independent of the potential. You can change the potential and the power law does not change. It is a universal behavior for all mm, models in which you get this kind of structure, repulsive hardcore singularity. If you have a model with repulsive hardcore interaction with anything else, then typically it has this structure, it has endpoints of lines of zeros. At the endpoints of zeros, there is some kind of a pileup, or maybe actually there are models known where the density of zeros goes to zero at the end point as a power. So density at epsilon distance will go as epsilon to the power a. Okay, a may be a positive number, not a negative number. So this power remains robust with respect to various changes. So what is it? So it turns out this power is called the Li Yang H singularity exponent. is density of zeros near the end point of zeros of line of end point of line of zeros goes as epsilon to the power sigma. Okay, and then it turns out that if you put any model which is uh, finite dimensional, so it's called d equal to zero models. Then you know, then sigma is equal to minus one. There is a just a single point, so that is uh, we said that the. Uh, partition function went like 1 upon 1 plus z, no, sorry, the partition function went like log 1 plus z that, mm, so uh, this is a limiting case, it, mm, actually all the zeros are at one point. So you can say that the zeros are like this, but this power epsilon, mm, sorry, this power sigma, if it tends to 1, the pileup becomes bigger and bigger a stronger divergence. In the limit, everything is at the end. So that is the point distribution. Okay, so in this sense, sigma is minus 1 for all d equal to 1 models. Sigma is minus 1 by 2. Okay, and this thing has been worked out exactly for d equal to 2 models and then the sigma is minus 1 by 6 and it is not known 
the exact value is not known in 3, 4, but in d equal to 6, which is sort of the upper critical dimension. So, I say d bigger than equal to 6, sigma is equal to plus 1 by 2. This we have not shown, but this is possible to show because you can show what happens in the spherical model. Uh, you can calculate something like this and it gives you sigma equal to half. Okay? So, that is sort of the interest in this model. And usually, there are things called critical exponents and they depend on two parameters. One is called n and one is called d any sort of some vector model index, you know, n vector model and d. But this repulsive hardcore singularity is very nice because there is no n, it only depends on d. You can construct all kinds of models with mm, different behavior, but they will have the same young H singularity exponent. Okay, so my time is kind of up. Uh, yeah, so. There is a article I can give you the reference to Hughes and Fisher. Ah, did I write the Hughes and Fisher reference? No, I wrote the Lie and Fisher reference. Journal of Chemical Physics. Nineteen ninety five one zero three eight one four four. This will give you a lot of other references on this topic. You know, it's just the starting reference, and um, I think that is the end of what I want to say. I there is one thing which I forgot to say earlier, which I should have said. So this particular theorem of Lee and Yang, which says that all the zeros lie on the unit circle. It's actually a very cute theorem and maybe the reason I didn't give you the proof is that I hope you will look it up. It's a nice short proof and Young in his 80th birthday was asked to comment on his work and of course he's a very modest man so he said oh my one you know when he was to select some of his most interesting work and he said this theorem is a minor gem. But of course, he, that's an understatement. You know. <laughs> it is a very profound result which comes from very elementary analysis and it has a wide applicability. And so all the students should be aware of it. All the students of statistical physics should be aware of that particular theorem. Okay, so I will stop there. If you have some questions, you can ask. Otherwise, then we meet again tomorrow. Yes. I don't know. Topological phase transition is too advanced a topic. Can it be dealt with in this? No, no, in this setup where I am dealing with some particles interacting with some potential. You should identify what are the degrees of freedom in your model. You know, I can allow all kinds of interaction in mine. Maybe not one species of particles, maybe five species of particles. Then I will put Z1, Z2, Z5. Then I will perhaps have to study this Li Yang theory in the Z1, Z2, Z5 complex multi dimensional planes, right? Already a little bit difficult because the theory of several functions of several complex variables is not quite as advanced as the theory we are discussing. Things like topological phase transition start with some extra variables which are not easily taken into account in this kind of structure. Okay, so I'm not able to answer it immediately for sure. I don't know if I think about it for one day. Can I still answer it? Maybe not, but you know, one can try. Ah, I should mention one more thing. Sometimes it happens that there is a line and then it, at one point it develops side arms. So it can undergo topological changes. 
which occurs when two of the zeros suddenly become complex. Instead of two real zeros, you have two complex zeros. Okay. So, at some point the lines may split and they may develop side lines. <coughs>